Let's just prepare our hearts this morning, church. our hearts with holy fire have your way this is your house yes just yes, yes. lift up those hands
blessing that you poured out so freely from above. Food and praises for compassion so amazing. Lord, we come to give you thanks for all you've done. Because of your love. That you poured out so freely from above. Sing gratitude and praises for compassion so amazing. Lord, we come to give you thanks for all you've done. Because of your love, of your love. of your love because of your love we're forgiven because of your love our hearts are clean, we lift you up with songs of freedom, forever we're changed, because of your love, see the church, because of his love, we're forgiven, because of your love. of your love. Yeah. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Church, we sing all together with open arms and open hearts. Follow your hearts and guide us. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Yes, Lord. Speak what? Sing once again. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. Cause I am found. I am yours. I am loved. I'm made pure. I have life. I can breathe. I am. Here's my heart. Here's 
the God of more than enough. again the chorus Thank you for joining us on this journey. I trust that even as we embark and we continue on this journey of faith, that God will begin to show you new things, that He will begin to challenge you, 
with new experiences and that your faith will grow through this. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the examples of the men and women of God in the Bible. We thank you for the Exodus journey, Lord. We thank you for Moses and their, their life of faith. I pray that their lessons will become our life experiences. We thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. In chapter 5 of Exodus, Moses and Aaron went finally and approached Pharaoh to make a request that God had asked them to bring before Pharaoh. And this says, The Lord God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. So they said, the, Lord, the God of Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go three days' journey into the desert and sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence of the sword. And the king of Is Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Go back to your labor. And Pharaoh said, Look, the people of the land are many now, and you make them rest from their labor. So the same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people in the offices, saying, You shall no longer make the people draw, give the people straw to make brick as before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. In part two of our series, I want to talk about the first stop. First stop in the journey. And for um, many of us, when we make a road trip, our first stop is always to gas up and uh, to ensure that we have enough of everything before we go on this long road trip. But not Israel. And um, first stops always reflect the important things that we need to put in place, the priority, so that we can ensure that we can finish the journey. No one sets out to begin a journey to fail. When we set out a journey, we want to make sure that we can complete it. And so the first stop in your journey is the most important. The first place, the first priority. So the first stop here, when you begin to read this portion of Scripture, is about establishing the place and the priority of worship. Um, perhaps you've read Exodus many times, but, you know, like me, you missed this um, first thought, why did God insist that Israel, before they would even uh, be given permission to li leave Egypt permanently, why would God ask them to go on a three-day journey just to worship? And uh, many have suggested different reasons. Of course, some commentators have even gone to the extent of saying that, well, God was trying to tell Moses to lie to Pharaoh, uh, to trick him. Um, you know, come on, God doesn't need to resort to trickery. You know, God is God. God is more powerful than, than that. God doesn't need to have to lie to us to get us to do things. And so when you really read and, and study more into this passage of Scripture, you realize that, that God was in essence trying to bring the people back to the place of worship. And likewise for all of us, there's a key truth in our lives that before you move into your wilderness, before you embark on life journey, we got it to invest in the place where God speaks. We've got to invest in the place where we draw from God directions, His Word. Faith comes by hearing. We've got to draw strength from Him, draw our resources that we require for the rest of the journey. So worship is, is really that central, um, that center of it all. Worship requires showing up before God, and dedicating yourself to him. And so Moses and Aaron went to ask for that three-day journey. Of course, the enemy will never grant you something that God wants for us. Whatever God desires for you, whatever God plans for you, the enemy wants the opposite. And so here in the story, Pharaoh is a picture of the enemy, and the enemy claims what is not his. In the first place, these are Israelites. They are not supposed to be subjects of the Egyptians. They were brought there to bless the Egyptians in the first place, but now the Egyptians have robbed them of their, their, their heritage, robbed them of the place, 
that God had planned for them. And the enemy will always try to stop a faith journey before it begins. Whether it's someone who has not yet tasted the goodness of God or someone who is, who's just come into the faith and wants to, to follow through and follow Jesus all the way. The enemy will come in and try to stop them dead in their tracks. And he will try to steal from them the potential, the legacy, the destiny that God has set for them. And so the enemy wants to hold on to God's people and the enemy wants to hold on to you as much as possible. If he cannot stop you from, from professing Christ in your life, then he will stop you from enjoying the life of Christ, the promises of Christ. And so the enemy wants to hold on to God's people. And the way that he has done it in, in Egypt for so long was that he used bondage, he used slavery. Today, he uses the same thing. He uses bondage and slavery, not in terms of a physical uh, slavery, uh, but there are different ways. There's spiritual bondages, there's, there's slavery to, to sin, there's slavery to substance abuse and uh, habits that, that are destructive, and the enemy uses that to hold us. Pharaoh is not um, objecting to the Israelites leaving for th three days. Um, he not only objected to it, but he actually made life even more difficult for them. And so whenever you see, you take the first step, you know, and, and I've seen this, when, when Christians want to move on for God, the enemy will come against them and say, you, you really? You want to serve God? Really? You want to move on with God? They start to give them more trouble. And so the enemy threatens and punishes all attempts to draw close to God. Here Moses says, let us go three days just to, to, to sacrifice and worship God that, as we should every Sabbath. And, and, and Pharaoh says, no. You mean you got so much time? You mean you were so free that, that you, you, you can afford to do that? You know, let me tell you this. Let me, let me make life even more difficult for you. Now you've got to do more work. Now you've got to collect your own straw. So, of course, you know, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters um, and their foremen, don't give them straw. Not only that, he says, let the labor be heavier on the men. Let them work at it so that they will pay no attention to false words. In other words, the enemy will come out and create things around our lives to make our lives more busy, the load heavier, the burden heavier, so that we have no time or energy to think about God. That's what basically that scripture in Exodus 5 verse 6 to 9 is saying. So often in your life when you want to move on with God and when you want to do and experience more of God's promises, the enemy makes it worse for us before it gets better. And so he uses poverty, he uses depravity to de de deprive you of your God-given potential. And of course, like, like I said, you know, some commentators have suggested that Pharaoh, uh, God uh, told Moses to lie to Pharaoh, but like I said, um, you know, God is bigger than that. He doesn't need lies and trickery to do that. Um, God does not use the same methods as the enemy. The enemy is an accuser, brethren. He's a liar. He's a trickster. He does that to trick people into a, a sinful lifestyle and then they get into bondage. They get into uh, depravity and all sorts of sin and they are kept there in that place. God doesn't do that. God speaks the truth. The Bible says you know the truth and the truth is set you free. So God is way more powerful than the, than the devil and he doesn't have to resort to human trickery or demonic uh, deception to try to get us to do the things that he wants us to do. And of course, you know, uh, the more important thing is in, in the next point, the enemy does not want us to worship God. If you know the history behind Lucifer, you know that Lucifer was one of the angels in heaven who led worship. He was a mighty uh, angel that was created just for that purpose. But one day he decided that worship of God it's so amazing, the glory, the, the, you know, the whole spectacle, everything, that he wanted the worship for himself. So he usurped the worship. He stole worship from God. And of course, the Bible tells us he was cast out from heaven with a third of the angels because all of them would rather that they be worshipped than worship God. And so the, the, the principal um, task and... and uh, object of the enemy working in our lives is to prevent us from truly and fully worshipping God. So if we can remember that, the Westminster Catechism declares that man's chief end is to glorify God. 
and to enjoy God forever. So that's our principal uh, purpose for, for, for life itself, not, not the enjoyment of life, not the development of your best life or whatever, you know, that some people may suggest. But really, we were created, we were saved to worship God, to glorify God, to please God. And the enemy wants to rob God of his worship. The enemy wants to turn that worship that we give to God to, unto himself. So we see here that the Pharaoh wants your worship. And that's basically what happened there. Pharaoh did not want the Israelites bowing to a greater deity than himself because in their culture, Pharaoh was their greatest God. He was their God. And any other God that would take them away was a competitor, was an enemy. So the Pharaoh wanted their worship and likewise the devil wants our worship. And the devil knows that if we commit ourselves to God, we will find freedom and salvation. We will not return back to slavery. Pharaoh knows that. Pharaoh knows that the moment they tasted God's goodness, they're gone. They're not going to be there anymore. So it's important for us to understand that the enemy always uses, always uses fear, intimidation, slavery, bondage, punishment to keep us where we are and to make us to worship him. And that's where you find that in, 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 in many man-made religions, uh, their adherents, the, the worshippers are kept there by fear. Fear of offending God, fear of offending whatever deity. You know, and whatever they do in their lives, in their worship, it is out of fear. But that's not our God. God requires faith in our worship. So anything that robs God of worship robs you of God's promises. So many people always look at it this way. Well, you know, what kind of God is this? Oh, God only wants our worship. He's so egocentric. He's so, you know, uh, he, he, he just wants people to bow to him, you know. And when you think about it, it's not true. Um, for too long, Israel was not, was not able to worship and sacrifice to God freely in the manner commanded by God. And, and so in Exodus 3, of course, uh, God was trying to restore to them this importance of worship. And why does God want us to worship Him alone? Which really brings me to, to why the moment they were set free, God again went back and put down in in words, in, uh, in stone, the Ten Commandments, and, and really the first four have to do with God. You know, in, in, um, it's recorded in Exodus 20, it says, And the Lord spoke these words, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make your, for yourself a calf image, an idol. You shall not bow down before them. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And then, of course, to sum it all up, about worship, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. And so the first four commandments are about returning and giving to God the worship that He desires. And it's not just about God being pleased that we bow down, kowtow to Him and, and worship Him. Uh, but God wants us to worship Him simply because it's the absolute best thing for you and I to worship Him. Let me explain. The Old Testament stories highlight again and again that the object of the Israelites' worship set their direction. If they worship the Baals, the Baals set the direction. If they worship the Astaroths or any other god or Pharaoh, it set the direction of their life. And in this case, Pharaoh, basically there was no direction. They were dead in the water. There was no destiny. There was no direction. They were just going round and round in their cycle of deprivation, of slavery, and there was no hope for the future and no, no hope for tomorrow. And so when Israel worshipped foreign gods, they took on the quality of those gods. If those gods were fearsome, those gods were, were uh, devious and, and bloodthirsty, then they took on that characteristics. Worshipping those gods led them down paths of death, slavery, where things like infanticide, Religious prostitution were commonplace. So God knew, you know, that, that for the people to worship Him, it was not so much for God than for the people because then they took on the image of God, God's kindness, 
God's love, God's blessing, and not Lucifer, the enemy's characteristics of those false gods. I want to move on to why God required a three-day trip to worship. Why not a half day? Why not just a Sabbath day? Why a three-day trip to worship? Why is it so specific three days? Why was that stop so important? And why did it have to be three days? Let me put it this way. True worship ought to cost something. I mean, for too long, they, they, they did not pay the price and they were not willing to pay the price for worship because they knew if we in Egypt try to keep our Sabbath and try to sacrifice, we will get into serious trouble and we're not willing to, you know, rock the boat. We're not willing to pay the price to be punished. Look at what's happening. All we ask for a three days trip to just go and worship and now our life is so hard proves to us, you know, it's going to cost us. But, you know, true worship costs something. The people of God are characterized by free worship, yes. But free worship costs you something. It's not free in that sense. There's still a cost attached to worshipping God. It's free in the sense that, yes, you can just speak to God, sing songs, give Him your heart, but it's not free in the sense that you have to sacrifice something. And I'm not talking about just animals back then or some, um, you know, animal sacrifice. I'm talking about sacrificing time, energy, risking so much other stuff. And Sabbath worship involves sacrifice. And you know that when Moses asked Pharaoh, he says, let us go three days to offer sacrifices. Offer sacrifices, which they have not been doing for, for a long, long time. And so Sabbath worship takes you away from your usual setting of life and work. To require three days means, man, you know what I mean? You put down tools for three days. You put down your, all the work implements, you put down everything for three days, and nothing happens for three days while you have to go for miles out of your way, hours and days out of your way just to worship God. That's very costly worship. And God was trying to restore that and challenge them. And so three days' journey in the wilderness removes the burden of work and slavery of their backs. And that's really part of the Sabbath principle. Why, the, why does the Bible have in the Ten Commandments, within the first four commandments, that you have to keep the Sabbath holy? It's so that we move away from our regular in and out slavery of work. Waking up in the morning, thinking about work, coming home and, and resting from work, the next day going into work, carrying the burden the implements of work, and then God says, no, six days you work, seven, you keep holy. And the seven, you worship the Lord. And so that three days was God trying to reestablish that. So the, the application is this. It's important during this season, particularly of the pandemic. In a sense, the pandemic is like Israel, Israel spending 400 years in Egypt because it was not normal at all, right? I mean, they, they were used to their own life. They were used to Worshipping God, working, doing the work that God gave them six days, the seventh they would worship God. And all of a sudden, their life was disrupted by slavery, by captivity in Egypt. And, and now everything is different. And they adjusted and they, they got used to the new normal of just building bricks, making bricks, working for the Egyptians. And they forgot that Sabbath is for God, that we're supposed to go to church. We're supposed to go and sacrifice to God. So it's important during this season of the pandemic that if you can attend in-person Sunday services, if you don't have kids that are not vaccinated, if you're not, you should make the three-day track back to church again. It's not going to take you three days, some of you 30 minutes or a little bit more, but it's important because if not, then you get caught up in the Egyptian way of life. And, and you lose that central aspect of the importance of, of Sabbath worship. And it's not just lo God losing out, we lose out if we don't keep that. So worship is about who you live to please. Why three days? Mindset of the slave. I've worked so hard to get to this place. We've worked so hard that now the Pharaoh is quite satisfied with our work. 
with what we do. I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to make him mad. I don't want to change the schedule. It's fine. So long as they don't beat us anymore, they don't kill our people, we will just do this the rest of our lives. We will just please the Pharaoh and not upset him. So it's just not about taking a three-day break from work. It's breaking the bondage of fear. That, well, if, 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 I, if, if, I, if I do this, then my taskmaster, my boss, my Pharaoh will be mad with me. In fact, I need to work harder to maintain my status quo. Even if the same old, same old is slavery, is bondage, I'm getting nowhere. You see, think about it this way. Your Sabbath worship is not for your employer. It is for God. It is for you. Sabbath worship is not entertainment for the rest of the congregation. It is for God. It's for God in your relationship. Our Sabbath worship is our expression of love and commitment to God. And that's where God put it as the first stop, the first priority to reestablish in the life of the Israelites. So true, true freedom is expressed in freedom to worship God without intimidation, without fear of consequences, without having to look beyond, around our shoulder and say, is the Pharaoh going to punish us? Which, of course, you know, they didn't get to go on their three-day journey and the Pharaoh put on even more burdens on them, which really goes to prove that, you know, Worship is about pleasing God. Who do you choose to please at the end of the day? Because if you choose not to please God, you know, then you're pleasing your boss. Well, you know, you, you still get what you get before, but you don't get from God what He promises. So it's expressed in freedom to worship God without... In Exodus 8 verse 26 in the Berean study Bible, it says, Moses replied, It would not be right to do that because the sacrifices we offer to the Lord our God would be detestable to the Egyptians... If we offer sacrifices that are detestable before the Egyptians, will they not stone us? I mean, he really knew. He knew this. If we worship God, if we go back to what God desires for us, our bosses will be upset with us. If we please our boss, then we displease God. Who would you want to displease today in your life? So the enemy will use lies, accusation, intimidation to stop believers for making worship a priority in their lives. And, and through years of ministry, so since the time I was young, you know, when people come to a place in their life, they'll be telling me, yeah, you know, but, but my boss wants me to work on a Sunday, you know, and, 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 and I need to work on Sunday. If not, I may lose my job. My boss may get mad with me, or, or I may never get that promotion. Well, my question to you is this. Do you want to displease God, or do you want to please Him in your life? Worship is about pleasing God in this aspect. And so the enemy will use anything to stop believers from making a wor worship, making Sabbath worship a principle, a priority in their lives. And the enemy knows a three-day journey to worship will transform the minds, the hearts of the Israelites. He knows that. That when they get back into connection with God again, when God begins to speak to them, when God begins to touch them, when God's presence begins to fill their, their whole worship that they would be set free. He knows the power of worship transform lives. And, and, and likewise, all of you here, you know the power of worship in your life, that when you truly worship Him, God will set us free. So it is true that God created us for His own pleasure, but it's also true that God wants us to worship Him. God's pleasure amounts to our blessing. In other words, it is His pleasure to bless us. When we please Him, He blesses us. We get more out of the worship than God does. And then let me move on to point B. A three-day journey can transform your world, your world. Have you noticed it was only three days' journey from slavery from, to freedom? Literally. You know, finally when they did leave and they were delivered, it was only three days out from Egypt past the Red Sea. Three days. Freedom, slavery. Fear, life evermore. In fact, if you look at the Bible, there's always a three-day journey, right? It's quite significant that the three days are there. It was a three-day journey that the Ark of Covenant would go ahead of Israel in the wilderness. It was a three-day journey for the disciples of Jesus 
between the horror of the cross and the victory of the resurrection. True God worship puts us on a path toward life, to a place where we begin to take on qualities of God's goodness, mercy, patience. It is a path that leads to real life and joy. So a three-day journey is a commitment to return to God's rule. If the people were willing to say, I'm going to go on a three-day journey, it was basically the, the, their, their commitment saying, whatever cost, we will pay. Whatever consequences, we will be willing to take it, so long as God is again worshipped and prioritised. A three-day journey is a test of trust. In fact, God does not have to tell anybody the full unfolding truth of any topic under the time is right. He frequently tests our attitude first. Basically, he's telling us, do you trust me enough to take a risk? Do you trust me enough to go on a three-day journey and then come back and face the Pharaoh? A three-day journey was not just the full unfolding truth. It was just the start of a much greater journey. It wasn't just three days. It was a journey of a lifetime. So if you cannot trust God for a three-day journey, if you cannot trust God to set aside just a Sabbath, how are you going to trust God for the rest of the six days, the rest of your life, that He would take care of everything else in your life? Again, in point three there, three days gives you a taste of freedom. It's interesting because the number three in the Hebrew culture it represents connection. Time is divided into three portions, the past, the present, the future. And, and three days is that connection. The position in time that is most important is the present because it is so fleeting and instantaneous. You can't change what you did yesterday, but you can decide today. And today is the connection between yesterday and tomorrow. So the function of present time as a connector of three days is so important. That's why the Bible says today, when God speaks to you, today, the connector of three days. And so the number three expresses connection. What you decide today connects the commands of yesterday to the promised land of tomorrow. And that's basically, that's what God was posing to Moses. Are you willing to make the connection with God and to make the connection with your, from the past promises to the future fulfillment of those promises. So that's where the three-day journey was God challenging them. And of course, again, I'm sure that God was challenging them and telling them, stop looking for happiness in the same place you lost it. They lost it in the last 400 years. They kept looking back and God saying, hey, three days means the future. Three days connects you to your destiny. Don't look back, look forward. In your life. Of course, three always identify some significant, important event. In the, in the Bible, it's referenced over 75 times. Do you know that the earth was separated from the waters on the third day? Three days. Jonah was in the belly of the whales. How many days? Three days. Joseph releases his brother from prison in Egypt. After how many days? Three days. The Theophany at, at, at Sinai was on the third day when God was transfigured. Jesus was missing for three days when he was 12 years old before his parents found him. Jesus prophesied that he will arise from the dead on the third day. Three days represent a significant event. Three days takes you from death to life. Three days takes you from slavery to freedom in the land. Three days takes you from merely surviving to abundant living. But the first step towards getting somewhere is to decide right now, the connecting point. Today, you've got to decide that you're not going to stay where you are. That's the first step. And that's what God was telling them, the first step, the first stop, is that you've got to decide. You've got to decide now. You've got to decide today that I will worship the Lord, that I will worship God, and that I will have no other idols, that He will be my first priority, that I will risk everything that I will sacrifice everything to worship God Almighty and I will keep the Sabbath. And if you're willing to do it today, 
you know what? The rest of your journey in your life, you will be able to keep that commitment and promise. And so I want to challenge you. Make that first stop. First stop is always at the altar. First stop is always in the presence of the Lord on the Sabbath to worship Him, to give to Him what belongs to Him and to say, God, You're the one who called me. You're the one who gave me life. You're the one who set me free. And you're the one that holds my future. I will worship you and you alone. I will give you what is due to you, O God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that your word is clear. Your word is powerful. Your word challenges us. Your word gives us faith. And your word changes our whole world. And so, Lord, I pray that this word will find a place in each one of our hearts, O God. That we will make that three-day track to sacrifice. That three-day significant event that we will reestablish the priority of worship in our lives. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Just want you to know that from next Sunday onwards, we'll be having one service in both campuses. So Vancouver will be 9.30 and Surrey will be 11.30 and we'll continue to do so until further notice, probably into the new year, until the children come back to praise land with their parents and then we, if we don't have enough room, then we'll have to go back to our two services in each campus. But until then, we're just going to go back to one in each and uh, this Christmas we want to celebrate together and I encourage you, come back again next Sunday. Make it a priority because God is waiting and God is here. God bless you all.